This evening we turn again to the book of John. Uh, This time, turning uh, several chapters forward uh, to John chapter 19, rather 18, sorry. John chapter 18. And as we did this morning, we take on a dauntingly large passage about a passage that is united by a common theme. So we're going to begin our reading in John chapter 18, verse 28. We'll read through uh, into chapter 19 to verse 22. Hear the word of God and receive it with a believing heart. Then the Jews led Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, the Jews did not enter the palace. They wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and asked, What charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, the Jews objected. This happened so that the words Jesus had spoken indicating the kind of death he was going to die would be fulfilled. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked? Or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. It was your people and your chief priests who handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then said Pilate. Jesus answered, You are right in saying I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? Pilate asked. With this he went out again to the Jews and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. But it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back, No, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in a rebellion. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him in the face. Once more Pilate came out and said to the Jews, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jews insisted, We have a law, and according to that law he must die because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? He asked Jesus, but Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jews kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, 
He brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the stone pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of Passover week, about the sixth hour. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, Take him away! Take him away! Crucify him! Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Here they crucified him and with with him two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Thus far, the reading of God's word. Uh, Dear brothers and sisters, friends, here we revisit the unfolding saga of Palm Sunday, if you will. This passage is not a passage that we would immediately associate with Palm Sunday, and yet, uh, as we're going to see There is indeed a strong tie between Palm Sunday and what is happening in the passage before us. And the the tie is seen in the major theme of what we've just read of kingship. Now, I don't know if you were counting. I didn't give you advance notice that kingship was the theme. But there are something in the vicinity of perhaps 15 references to kingship. Uh, Jesus as king, or allusions to Jesus as king. And the question that we might grapple with as we come to this, kind, uh, this passage is, what kind of king is this? Because let's be honest, from a fleshly perspective, this is not the kind of king that we want. We don't want a king that is openly mocked. We don't want a king that is, uh, re- remains silent through much of the, uh, this interrogation, a king uh, that is not willing to exercise his power to protect himself, because if he can't protect himself, what kind of protection can he offer us? No, we want a king that looks more like a king. We want a king that acts more like a king. But what John does here under the inspiration of the Spirit, as as he uh, weaves this narrative, as he puts together his description of the events from Palm Sunday to the crucifixion, is he contrasts the difference between the king that we seek and the king that we need. King that we seek versus the king that we need. Our theme for this evening is the coronation of King Jesus because uh, as I understand what John is writing here, that's exactly what we are led to understand that Jesus' moments of greatest humiliation in the world's eyes are actually Jesus' moments, uh, the, 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 the time at which Jesus is crowned as the king of God's people in a very strange and subversive way. And we're going to unfold this theme by um, contrasting King Jesus with several different actors or several different groups. Uh, We're going to consider King Jesus, first of all, uh, contrasted with Pilate, who, in many ways, I I suppose, is the kind of king that the world wants. But then we're going to uh, compare King Jesus to those 
uh, for whom he comes. Not simply for the, uh, the Jews, but uh, also for uh, the soldiers. And then thirdly and finally, we sing, uh, we're going to see King Jesus as he is enthroned among criminals. So consider in the first place, uh, King Jesus, the witness to truth. King Jesus, the witness to truth. And we see this uh, described for us in chapter 18, verses 28 through 40. Uh, here we read of a turn o- uh, turning over of custody. Uh, Jesus was taken into custody the day before these events uh, on taking place on Friday, uh, the day that we uh, call Good Friday. He's taken into custody by the Jewish leaders, and he's interrogated by the Jewish leaders. And when they're done insulting and abusing him and falsely accusing him, now they bring him to Pilate. Very interesting, by the way, if you compare what's happening here with Psalm 2, which we sang at the beginning of the the service, where you have the different rulers of the world conspiring together against the Lord and against his anointed. It is not just the, uh, the Jewish leaders that have a part to play. It is uh, Pilate, the representative of the Roman government of his day, that has a part to play. And so they bring uh, Jesus, uh, the, the Jewish leaders bring Jesus to Pilate, and they make this accusation. Now notice that this accusation is not in our text, Um, But the accusation uh, we find in Luke chapter 23, verse 2, is we have found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be Christ a king. Well, very uh, logically, uh, Pilate asks them, well, why are you bringing him to me? Why don't you judge him according to your own law? Well, the, the... the reason becomes immediately evident. It is because they are seeking the death sentence, which they do not have the the authority to impose. So if Jesus is indeed going to put to death as they feel he must be, he must be turned over to Pilate and to the Roman government. Now there's an interesting note at the beginning of this passage that gives us a window into the human soul. Look at verse 28. By now it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, the Jews did not enter the palace. They wanted to be able to eat the Passover. Think about this, folks. Here, these these people are involved in an act of cosmic treason, national treason, guilty of the highest crimes known to humanity, but they're scrupling at entering Pilate's house lest they be defiled and be rendered unclean. The scruples of sinners. Well, they bring Jesus to Pilate. Pilate takes Jesus into his house, don't, uh, into the palace. Don't miss the fact that that renders Jesus unclean. I believe that that is significant. So Jesus is brought into the palace, no such scruples for him, though he's been a God-fearing Jew all his days. And Pilate's questioning of Jesus really revolves around what kind of a king Jesus is. He says, um, are you the king of the Jews? Well, Jesus, as he so often does, responds with his own question. Is that your own idea? Or did others talk to you about me? Jesus is taking the measure of this man. But what Pilate is uh, seeking to determine beyond uh, simply idle curiosity, no doubt he's very familiar with Jesus' reputation. He could not possibly have been governor um, of the territory and not been familiar with this one who most recently has raised Lazarus from the dead. Uh, He cannot be... Uh, unaware of the great throng of people that just several days before had welcomed the same man as their king. And so he's curious, he's, he's probing, and he's, he's also perhaps probing at the same time. Is there any, anything to uh, this accusation that, that Jesus is treasonous, that Jesus is um, a threat or a competitor to the Roman government? Well, Jesus 
responds to him and he says, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews, but now, now my kingdom is from another place. You see, Jesus answers Pilate's question, what kind, what kind of king are you? Saying, I'm a king unlike any king that you know. I am the king of truth. I bear witness of the truth. That's the very purpose for which I've come into the world, is to bear witness of the truth. Notice the purpose statement, right? We had a purpose statement this morning. I have come into the world to glorify the Father's name. Now I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. But, but there's also a further implication, uh, 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 an implication that uh, Pilate cannot have been fully unaware of, and the implication is this. Uh, not only have I come as a witness of truth, but I actually rule by the power of the truth. Uh, by the way, that's what the, the prophet Isaiah had already stated uh, centuries before this time. Isaiah chapter 11, he spoke of uh, the root of Jesse, uh, the shoot that would come from Jesse's stump, who would uh, rule in justice. He would rule not according to what he saw with his eyes or what he heard with his ears, but he would rule according to things as they are. And now the irony is that this king of truth, the eternal word of truth, is on trial before a sinful man. A sinful man, by the way, who's so jaded that we hear him saying, verse 38, what is truth? Does that sound familiar, guys? That should sound really familiar because that is exactly where we are at as a nation and as a, 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 in the Western world, uh, generally speaking. This man's uh, so jaded, he's, he's lost any mooring uh, from the truth. And so then uh, we ought not to expect, and we will see that there is not going to be a just judgment that is rendered. And this is the kind of man that is going to try the king of truth. Now, Jesus, don't miss uh, Jesus' mercy in this encounter. Because Jesus actually issues an invitation as it were, to seek the truth. He says, a man is measured by his relationship to the truth. Uh, look at what he says uh, specifically in uh, verse 37 at the very end. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Now, Pilate, if he was wise, Pilate would ask Jesus more questions at this point. Um, and, and, and Jesus here is clearly revealing him uh, to be the incarnate uh, wisdom of God, of which, if you were to turn back to the, bo the book of Proverbs, the repeated refrain in Proverbs 1, Proverbs 2, Proverbs 3, and, and so on, is, seek for the truth. Look for it. Treasure it. If you seek it, you will find it. And this is the measure of a person. But the truth is, is that too often, we're too proud to seek the truth. How so? Because we don't want to ask. We don't want to ask God. We don't want to ask other people. We don't want to be led by those who seem to have uh, clearly demonstrated wisdom in their life. We don't want to seek it in God's word. We want to go it on our own. We're too proud so often to seek the truth. Or too lazy, right? Because seeking the truth might actually entail work. It might entail some effort. And so it is with, with uh, Pilate. Is he proud? Is he lazy? Is he both? He won't seek the truth. But nevertheless... He does render a verdict, not guilty. Verse 38, I find no basis for a charge against him. Now notice then the contrast between Pilate and Jesus. 
With Pilate, we see a man who's jaded. What is truth? Right, he's a man of his age. He's a man of the the Greco-Roman world. But he's also a pragmatist. We, um, that, that is, he always wants a, a practical solution. He's not concerned with principle so much as he is concerned with the outcome. And that's what makes him spectacularly unfit as a judge. Because he's facing a, a, a group of people that want an innocent man put to death. Principle says, stand on the truth. Pragmatism says, hey, that might make you unpopular. That might not work out too great. You might have insurrection. You might have uprising on your hands. You see, the text reveals our need for a different kind of king than the world can offer. You see that? Our time reveals the same need, by the way. We need King Jesus who always rules according to the truth, who is able to subdue the nations by the truth. This is the kind of king that we need, although uh, not necessarily the kind of king that we, according to the flesh, want. And so we find this scene, then this first scene, uh, closing with King Jesus, the witness to the truth. But let us not miss the, the closing shot uh, found for us in verse 39 where Pilate, having found Jesus not guilty, says, it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back, no, no, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in a rebellion. We read in Mark 15, verse 7, a man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists who had committed murderer. Uh, murder. So he's, an, he's a treasonous man. He's been involved in a recent insurrection, and he's actually been involved with murder. And this is the kind of man that is allowed to go free. Again, now take the idea of Jesus entering into the palace being rendered unclean, and take the, the idea of this substitution that is taking place. Jesus taken into custody, Barabbas the murderer repla- uh, uh, released. What a picture. What a picture of exactly what King Jesus came to do. To offer himself in the place of sinners. To offer himself in the place of liars, in the place of cowards, dare I say pragmatists. In the uh, the place of those who come forth from the womb speaking lies. in the place of treasonous people, enemies alienated from God by our sin. King Jesus, the witness to truth, the king that we need. But secondly, we see King Jesus despised and rejected by men. And we see this now in chapter 19, verses 1 through 15, what we'll call scene 2. So we, we see Pilate, again, ever the pragmatist, and he's seeking a way out of his conundrum. To his credit, he's not entirely comfortable with what's going on. But he thinks, uh, rather than than, uh, seeking wisdom from outside, he thinks to himself, I have a plan. This is my plan. I will have him beaten and abused, and maybe if I get him roughed up enough, I turn him over to my thugs, that'll arouse Uh, On the one hand, that will pacify the people. Maybe on the other hand, it will also arouse a kind of sympathy because who wants to see a Jew being beaten by a Roman? And then I put him in front of them and, and maybe we can slip out of here without being entirely trapped. Seems like a good compromise. So now we have Jesus significantly clothed in a purple robe, verse 2. uh, Verse 3, crowned, um, or no, sorry, verse 2, crowned with a crown of thorns and hailed mockingly as the king of the Jews as he's being beaten and struck. Now Pilate, uh, following this, presents him to the crowd saying, 
um, look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. He presents him in his uh, kingly raiment of purple with the crown of thorns uh, bloodied and bruised and hurting, an object of pity, an object of scorn, an object of misery. And he presents him, here is the man, as if to say, behold, your king. Well, he underestimated the hatred of the Jewish leaders toward Jesus. And, lest we miss uh, another significant point here, he underestimated the fickleness of the human heart. Can you doubt for a moment that some um, uh, present here in this scene are those who lined the roads just five days earlier? Who rejoiced in Jesus? who saw Jesus as someone great and to be desired. But their hearts are easily turned by who speaks last. Well, it happens to be the Jewish leaders. And so today, Jesus, the son of David, must die. He must die. There is this insistent rejection of Jesus. We see here the danger of mob rule. We see how easily the hearts of men are swayed. And we see also Pilate's growing desperation. Uh, because now uh, there is a, a new piece of evidence inserted into uh, the discussion, which is that Jesus uh, has claimed to be the Son of God. And that according to the Jewish law, that this is... Um, a sin that is worthy of death. So uh, Pilate goes back into chambers with Jesus and begins to interrogate him once more, asking him, where do you come from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Now let's take a moment to focus the lens on Jesus himself. Could Jesus not have defended himself? What might Jesus have said in this particular instance? Did Jesus not uh, have powerful scriptural evidence for his claim? And yet, you have to understand that while Jesus was mistreated, Jesus was taken by the sinful, because of the sinful hearts of men, Jesus was killed because of the sinful hearts of men, that Jesus came to put himself precisely in this position. How hard is it for you to keep from defending yourself? For me, it's pretty hard sometimes. Jesus utters not a word. He does not try to persuade. He doesn't try to convince. He brings no one to speak on his behalf. He remains silent. And he remains silent for you, dear people of God. He stood there, uttering not a word. He submits himself to the manifest injustice of his circumstances in order to accomplish the will of God, which is the salvation of his people. Well, then... Pilate begins uh, to bluster and to, and to threaten, as it were, saying, why are you remaining silent? Don't you know that I have power over you? And Jesus says, oh no, <laughs> you do not possess the power over me that you think that you do. Uh, let us be abundantly clear, first of all, that your authority is a derived authority and I would not be under your power if it had not been ordained by the one who is above. But he also says that those who brought me to you, they bear the greater guilt. Why? Because they ought to have recognized their Messiah. And actually, it seems uh, rather clear that for a number of them, they did in fact recognize their Messiah. They just, he wasn't the one they wanted. They wanted something different. They wanted a different kind of king. Now in verses 13 through 15, we see the sad story of Pilate's collapse. 
Yet again, he presents Jesus to the Jews as their king. Yet again, they shout, take him away, crucify him. He asks, shall I crucify your king? We have no king but Caesar. By the way, they pulled their trump card too on him, didn't they? They, they, they used the, the, the one thing that's most likely to back a man like Pilate into the corner, which is saying that if you're a friend of Jesus, you're an enemy of Caesar. Well, sorry, discussion over. Because Pilate's not the kind of man that rules by principle. He rules according to pragmatism. We see Jesus, the king of the Jews, despised and rejected by men, rejected by the soldiers, mocked by them as they beat him, as they strike him, as they persecute him, rejected by his own people, um, the people of the Jewish nation. We find him sentenced to death. The fear of man triumphs over the fear of God. The fear of man triumphs over allegiance to the truth. Which brings us then now to our third scene. King Jesus, a king enthroned among criminals. Things didn't go exactly the way that the Jewish leaders planned. I mean, okay, in some sense they did, right? They got what they wanted. But what they entirely missed, something that John, uh, under the inspiration of the Spirit, captures very well, is that when they put him on the tree, it was as if he sat on the throne. There he sat, the king among criminals. He was removed from the city as unclean. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. And we notice that the, the, the very uh, location of his crucifixion is significant, right? He has been rendered unclean by his contact with uh, going into the palace. He has been uh, offered now as a substitute for Barabbas the murderer. And now he also, like the burnt offerings of old, must be carried outside of the camp. We read in Leviticus 16, the bull and the goat for the sin offerings, whose blood was brought into the most holy place to make atonement, must be taken outside the camp. The writer to the Hebrews picks up on the same point. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 12. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. Then, as if to add insult to injury, missing entirely the significance of what they did, they enthroned him between two criminals, the very types that he came to save. Illustration of the very nature of his death. What it was that he was doing. And note this. This isn't just an imagination or imposed upon the text, for we read in verse 19, Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. You see, he's lifted up upon the cross, and there is, as it were, a banner proclaiming his identity. And proclaiming his identity, by the way, in three languages, so that anybody of any nation that was literate walking by the cross that day would be in no doubt about who Jesus was. Jesus, the King of the Jews. (laughs) The chief priests, they can't quite deal with that, right? They say, no, 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 no. We need you to make a change. Do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. You see him there. The king that you need, hanging there between thieves, brought outside the camp to make holy Those, uh, uh, to make holy his people through the shedding of his blood, to make atonement uh, for his people. In this passage, as we've covered it, we've seen 
the difference between Jesus and the kings and rulers of the world. We've seen, secondly, the fact that Jesus is not the kind of king that the world wants. We see, thirdly, that Jesus is exactly the kind of king that we need. Maybe you caught that our call to worship this evening came from Psalm 72, one of the kingship psalms. And uh, Psalm 72 says this, Endow the king with your justice, O God, the royal son with your righteousness. He will judge your people in righteousness. He will take pity on the weak and needy and save the needy from death. All nations will be blessed through him and they will call him blessed. The king, Jesus, the king that you need. Do you know Jesus as your king? What are you looking for in a king? To put it in more American terms, we don't like kings. <laughs> what are you looking for in a president? A ruler? A governor? Do you want a king of truth? Who rules not according to what he sees, not according to what he hears, but according to things as they really are? who discerns things as they really are, who bears witness to the truth, who exercises his rule through the proclamation of his word. Don't miss the significance of this fact that tonight in our midst, Jesus Christ is exercising his rule through the proclamation of his word. Because you are responding in one way or another to the word. Either A, you are rebelling, uh, acting against the proclamation of Christ, or you are being subdued and conformed unto the image of Christ in your heart, which is unruly, is finding in him and seeing in him what you need. But then as a final application of this point, by the way, the missing point of the sermon this morning, did anybody notice the middle point was missing? Is the identification of servants with their master. We talked, we said the second point was the promise. Well, it's the promise of glory for all who trust Christ. You see, if, Je if Jesus bears the cross, his servants must not think themselves above the cross. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore. For here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for a city that is to come. Hebrews 13, the continuation of the idea of Christ outside the camp. Do you look at Jesus at Golgotha or at Gabbatha or in Gethsemane as someone who is weak, as someone who is contemptible, as someone who is of questionable ability? Or do you identify with him? Where you go, I will go. If you must suffer, I must suffer. Because my present is linked to you. And my future is linked to you. And my past is covered by you. Jesus may not be the kind of king that you want. But I state to you on the authority of God's word this evening, he is exactly the king that you need. Will you submit to him? Will you worship him? Will you love him? Will you follow him? Will you suffer for him? Will you be crucified with him day by day? Will you live out of the power of his resurrection? May God grant that the answer for every one of us this evening is yes and amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you have not left this world to the anarchy and the tyranny that is native to sinful people. Lord, uh, we've 
study this evening a passage which details the greatest injustice in the history of the world. And yet, it was an injustice that was suffered with a great purpose in mind, the purpose that you would gather in your people, the purpose that your people might be reconciled unto you through faith in the death, a resurrection, ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you uh, were as a, a sheep before its shearers silent, that you did not defend yourself, that you did not pers- uh, seek to persuade or to escape the injustice of men, but that you were offered in our place. We thank you, Lord, even for the very image of you crucified between two criminals. For we acknowledge such are we, Lord. We acknowledge you as as our king. We love you. We want to obey you. We want to serve you uh, more and more fully. So we pray that you would empower us by your life-giving spirit to do so. For we ask all of these things in your name. Amen.